Thank you all. I'm excited to be here and excited to be the first uh, not from Dunedin to uh, speak at uh, TEDx Dunedin. I am from a small town in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I grew up uh, looking at the uh, night sky and uh, wondering what was out in the heavens. Uh, I had the good fortune to have a uh, school assignment where I was asked to interview someone who worked in an interesting field. I interviewed uh, an astronomer and was very um, excited by the work of this astronomer, uh, getting to view the heavens, getting to teach, getting to do research. I thought that was a great uh, way to uh, start a career. Was also interested in engineering, interested in learning how uh, things are put together. Uh, so I did decide to study engineering. Uh, and along my journey, I uh, made a stop at uh, NASA to uh, train to become an astronaut. And I've had the good fortune to uh, have three uh, uh, flights on the shuttle uh, into space. So a lot of my uh, choices were uh, made um, because I tried to choose something broad, something that uh, would allow me uh, many opportunities. And I was also encouraged along the way uh, by my teachers and by my parents. But uh, I made a stop in 1996 at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. This is where all of the astronaut training occurs. And uh, I joined a class of um, 43 other astronauts in uh, 1996. There were 2,500 applicants for 35 U.S. slots, and then we had nine uh, international partner slots. Uh, one of the first things that we do if you're not uh, military, which is uh, not my background, is that we uh, go through a series of uh, land and water survival training. We become familiar with the gear that we'll have to use, so we're building uh, uh, tents uh, from our parachutes. We're uh, learning how to weave uh, fishing nets from the parachute cord. And uh, we're also learning how to uh, build fires with the flint and the other parts of the, uh, the uh, survival pack. Uh, in order to uh, fly our aircraft, we uh, have ejection seat training. Uh, we don't actually uh, jump out of the aircraft, but uh, we go through a series of training uh, in these ejection seats. And then also we're trained uh, how to land um, very safely uh, if we're coming down through trees or through power lines. And in the event that we uh, land in water, uh, we have an opportunity to practice on a slide and inflate our life preserver units. Uh, something that happens if you do land on water is that your parachute drags you, so you have to be sure to uh, detach yourself from it. So we're actually dragged behind a boat, uh, which is a little bit unpleasant, but it teaches you to uh, be sure to detach your parachute um, before it drags you under the water. Uh, there's also uh, rafts, so you uh, have to bail the water out, get in your raft, and then you can um, uh, signal to a rescue helicopter overhead. Uh, we have an opportunity to parasail, again, not jumping out of the boat, but uh, not jumping out of the airplane, but uh, being lifted off of the boat, uh, having the lines cut, and then we steer the uh, parasail down. Uh, we have an opportunity to learn how to fly a military aircraft. We have the T-38s that we train. We're all required to uh, fly a certain number of hours in this aircraft. And it's a standard uh, military cockpit with standard military instruments. And a standard look inside, uh, since we're flying as high as uh, 45,000 feet uh, on occasion, um, we have to have supplemental oxygen and uh, standard things that uh, accompany military aircraft. Uh, this is a more fun aircraft. It's affectionately called the Vomit Comet. Uh, so we tend to get a little bit sick on this aircraft, but it flies a series of uh, parabolic uh, flight paths. So it goes through uh, two Gs uh, in the base, and then at the peak of the parabola, we uh, experience about 20 seconds of weightlessness. So we're able to test our procedures uh, before we fly um, our hardware into space. And then we also, as uh, astronaut candidates, have a little bit of fun uh, as we experience uh, our, have our first experience with microgravity. Uh, we have a series of trainers uh, at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, basically, this is how we learn how to interface with the systems on the shuttle. There are fixed space trainers where we learn at each of the systems and review the procedures. There's also a motion-based trainer uh, where the pilots have an opportunity to uh, practice landing uh, the shuttle with uh, graphics. And uh, we have a little bit of classroom work uh, where we uh, uh, travel to the middle uh, part of the U.S and do some geological training, identifying uh, geological formations and doing some uh, rock and soil uh, collection. We uh, do a lot of work with our suits. Uh, this is the spacewalking suit. 
and we have a pool facility where we practice training. It's very heavy, it weighs about 250 pounds. So uh, it's probably one of the only fields where you have to have help putting on your pants. And then you uh, put on the, uh, the upper part. Uh, it's also attached to a stand, so that does help uh, relieve the weight a little bit. And then we have a pool facility where the uh, uh, space shuttle and space station mock-up facilities are underwater. Uh, because water, in water you can be neutrally buoyant, it's a good way for us to uh, practice our spacewalking. And uh, it's about 100 feet long, 200 feet wide, and 40 feet deep. Another suit that we wear is a launch and entry suit. Uh, it's a pressure suit, basically, if you're flying in a high altitude aircraft uh, and it depressurizes, you'll need to have uh, protection. Uh, and so our, our pressure suits are very similar, uh, protect us against uh, the atmosphere, temperature, and then uh, provide oxygen to us uh, if we need it. Uh, there are other uh, trainers uh, in Houston. In case there's something wrong with the hatch, there are many ways to get out of the shuttle. Um, just like with an aircraft, you can. Uh, for us, we can pop the overhead windows. There's also a slide that's very common on an aircraft. Uh, if, uh, if you need to get out, you slide down the slide, um, and so forth. Uh, once our in initial two-year uh, candidacy training is complete, we start training for a mission. Uh, so this is uh, part of my crew uh, on STS-133. We flew to the International Space Station in, August, in April of uh, 2010. Here you see the Commander Allen and uh, Jim, the pilot. And uh, we are working in a fixed space trainer. In the aft part, there's a robotic arm station. So I'm getting that configured. Uh, we have many ways to uh, practice flying the robotic arm. Uh, there's another facility that's called a dome facility where uh, the graphics are basically displayed overhead. So we have a view of the shuttle and also of the space station. And uh, there are hand controllers, and we can work with the procedures to fly the robotic arm. A different uh, facility is called a virtual laboratory facility where we have an opportunity to integrate the robotics and the spacewalking. So these uh, funny looking guys are uh, Rick and Clay. They are our spacewalkers on the mission. So they actually are looking at a 3D view through their headsets. And they're able to move around the International Space Station using this graphical representation and uh, practice their spacewalks. Uh, they have also uh, practiced with the hardware in a vacuum chamber. Uh, this is Dottie who's uh, helping Clay get uh, suited up, and uh, he'll spend about 10 hours uh, in this chamber. Uh, it's brought down to a vacuum. Uh, for a spacewalk, it's generally about six hours, but they get into their suits about two hours prior and maybe um, about an hour uh, following the spacewalk. So they might be in their suits about a total of nine or 10 hours. So it's good time to uh, practice uh, being in the vacuum chamber first prior to uh, doing a spacewalk. And when all that work is complete, we uh, uh, spend our time uh, launching on the shuttle. It's the best eight and a half minute ride that I've ever had uh, into space. First, uh, the first two and a half minutes are under the uh, solid rocket booster propulsion along with the liquid uh, propulsion. So there's a little bit of vibration for about two and a half minutes and the solid rocket boosters uh, fall away. And then it's a very smooth ride for the remaining six minutes or so uh, into orbit. Uh, we uh, spend our time uh, going to the International Space Station. Over the past uh, several years, we've been building it. It's now complete. Uh, we have an extension from the US president to uh, uh, continue to do science uh, research on the orbiting laboratory until 2020. Uh, we're hoping to extend that um, till about 2025. But there's research that's done in the areas of biology, material science, uh, combustion, uh, fl uh, fluids and, and materials. And uh, it's just a wonderful uh, place to conduct research. It gives us an opportunity when we look back on Earth to um, reflect on Earth and really to realize how fragile it, it is and how much we have to do to preserve it for future generations. So many people say, what is the future of NASA and what should be the future of human exploration? Uh, we're working on a replacement for the shuttle. It's basically a capsule, much like Apollo, uh, that'll be ready in 2015. The launch vehicle will be ready in 2018, and uh, we are still working on the destination. We'd like to go somewhere outside of low Earth orbit, either back to the moon or onto Mars or to an asteroid. But uh, this is something that um, I believe the world should be involved in and in deciding where humans should go uh, once we're able to go outside of low Earth orbit. But it's vitally important. Uh, the work that the research that we do in space uh, really brings uh, 
technology back here on Earth, and it really uh, makes our lives much better here. The, uh, lots of uh, uh, technology that we've done for medical research, uh, work in hospitals, material research, has all made our lives better here. And so the work that we do and the reflection that we're able to do in space uh, greatly benefits our lives here. And I thank you very much. <laughs>